Good morning, everybody. To the Oregon, uh, Oregon Rural Health Conference, our 37th annual Oregon Rural Health Conference. We are excited to have you here and to our first virtual conference. I want to start out by thanking our gold partners, All Care Health and the Oregon Rural Health Association, our silver partners, Eastern Oregon Coordinated Care Organization, and the Oregon Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, and the River House on the Deschutes, our bronze partner, our QI partners, and our copper partners, Westcom, the American College of Education, and Inquisync. It's through their support and partnership that we're able to offer this week's conference to you at no cost. And we really, really appreciate that their continued support. Another important part of our conference, as you know, are, um, uh, are the surveys that you will receive at the end of each day. Uh, it is really important that you fill those out. One, if you want continuing education, you must fill one out to, uh, in order to get that. Two, you are entered into a drawing for a $100 gift card. And three, it is really important to us to hear from you whether we are doing the best job we can and are giving you what you need. So as we can improve our conference through your feedback, it is really, really important for us. We have limited time today because of how much content we have for question and answer. So I'm encouraging everyone to please uh, put any questions and answers. Or, sorry, we'll we'll put the answers in. Put the questions in the box, uh, the question and answer chat box there on your screen. And at the end, if we are able to have time, we will add those. Uh, we'll add some additional questions as well. Uh, so with that, I would like again to thank you for being here and introduce our speakers. We have Rob Cowie, who's the Communication Director of the Oregon Health Authority, Cassie King, VP of Brand Services and Corporate Communications for All Care Health, and Brooke Pace, Communications and Public Relations Director for Wallowa County Health Care District. With that, I'll turn it over to you all. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for having me here. As Robert said, I'm Rob Cowie, Communications Director of the Oregon Health Authority. And the health authority is responsible for overseeing the state public health system, and we are a lead agency in the COVID-19 response. So I'm glad to be here to talk about how we are keeping rural Oregonians informed during the COVID-19 pandemic. And as you know, this is a time when we all need to work together to stop the spread of COVID-19 at the same time as we're staying socially distant. It's also a time when we see disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 on different communities across the state as well as regional differences in case rates and differences in public attitudes about the pandemic. So with our common purpose of fighting COVID-19, as well as all the differences in mind about how the pandemic is affecting different communities, I want to tell you how we're communicating to rural audiences at this time and share some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. Next slide. So I'm going to cover three major topics. First off, I want to give you a sense of how OHA is approaching our task in raising public awareness during the pandemic. I'll also cover, cover some of the challenges we faced and some of the opportunities we've seen to strengthen communications to priority audiences, especially to rural audiences. And as this slide shows, rural counties continue to be among the hardest hit on a per capita basis during this pandemic. And rural counties have been a major focus of the work that we've been doing. I also want to share results from statewide opinion research that we recently conducted on COVID-19, go over some of the responses we received from Oregonians about what they're doing to stay safe, things that they're not doing to stay safe, and some of the lessons that uh, that research offers to communicators in raising public awareness and helping to uh, help Oregonians uh, take the steps they need to protect themselves and others. Okay, next slide. So Oregon's first case was diagnosed on February 28th, 2020. We were one of the first states in the nation to record a diagnosed COVID-19 case. And since then, it's been both a sprint and a marathon. So let me talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing on the communications front and how we've applied those lessons to rural audiences. Next slide. So within two hours of the first case being diagnosed in Oregon on February 28th, we held a news conference with Governor Brown, and we've been working fast and furiously ever since then. 
because all of you know, accurate communications is a vital tool to stop the spread of the virus. Communications is a foundational uh, component of a modernized public health system. And it has been a priority for us since that first case was, was diagnosed. Since February, we stood up a health information center that has been the primary engine for informing the public about the COVID-19 pandemic. And our health information center, or what we lovingly call it as the HIC, uh, in that time has produced 5,600 documents and translated those documents into 11 different language, languages. And just by comparison, uh, in that time, the CDC has produced over 4,000 documents and uh, they uh, translated uh, their documents into five different languages. So Oregon has been outpacing the federal response on the communications front. I think we've been pleased to see that uh, we've reached a large number of Oregonians in that time with a wide range of content. We have a coronavirus update newsletter that goes out to 156,000 subscribers of so people who have signed up on their own to receive it. And uh, several months into the pandemic, we were getting a, an open rate of that newsletter of, of 70%. It's dropped down to about 55%, I think, as people are beginning to get uh, experience some fatigue with COVID-19. Um, but those are still really outstanding uh, measures. Uh, our COVID-19 webpage receives 23,000 visits a day. Again, that's a little bit down from the approximately 30,000 visits a day that we were getting at the outset. Uh, but that's still uh, uh, or an intense amount of traffic and uh, speaks to the, the concerns that Oregonians have about COVID-19. And then social media uh, has also been a major focus for us. Uh, we've had uh, our, our best performing posts received more than 300,000 um, views on Facebook. Uh, we do regular uh, uh, Facebook Live events where we've had 26,000 views of uh, people tuning in to learn about testing, learn about ways to keep themselves safe during uh, holidays uh, and other topics. Uh, and then it's been a priority for us uh, to make sure that we're communicating in multiple languages, um, including news conferences with the governor and including our Facebook Live events. And uh, we routinely have about 14,000 Spanish speakers tuning into our Spanish simulcast when we do news conferences and Facebook Live events. So this slide here summarizes some of our key goals and strategies uh, and, so it, and provides some examples of, of the tools that we've been using, which um, I just you know, kind of gave you a, a quick overview of. Uh, but basically, our goals are really to, to keep people safe and stop the spread of COVID-19. That is our primary communications goal during this pandemic. Uh, another important goal is to keep people up to date on reopening, school metrics, state guidance, actions that the state is taking to protect them, protect their communities, and, uh, and help people stay informed about rules and guidelines. A critical goal essential to all the work we're doing is centering and advancing health equity. Uh, we know that COVID-19 affects different communities at different rates. And it's critical for us to, to speak to communities in their languages, uh, in ways that are culturally competent and responsive, and really emphasize uh, communicating through the pathways that people rely on to receive the information they need to stay safe. And then last, but certainly not least, supporting partners. We know that at OHA, we can't do it alone. We know that there are other voices who are trusted in their communities. We want to keep those partners up to date so that they can keep their communities informed and safe. Next slide. So quickly, I just want to talk about some of the hurdles that I think all of us face in raising public awareness about COVID-19, as well as some of the opportunities. Uh, the slide on the left, I think, is an overview of the the current state of communications capacity in the state's uh, state and local public health system. So uh, this is a slide pulled from a modernization report uh, that uh, OHA released uh, uh, a couple of years ago. 
And we know that as a state, we lag behind other states in having all the components of a fully modernized public health system. Uh, uh, our, all our neighboring states, including Idaho, invest more on a per capita basis in, in public health than, than Oregon. Um, and only one third of communities have all the components of a fully modernized public health system. And as you see here from this slide, uh, nine out of 10 Oregonians live in places that only have partial or minimal public health communications capacity. And that's a big barrier when a pandemic strikes or any health event. It's critical for people to know the risks, for people, not, for people to, to understand what they need to do to keep themselves safe, and then for people to know what's evolving, what we don't know, what's uncertain, and, and what actions the state's taking to, uh, to provide more information and take further action to, to, to protect them. Another barrier that I know that all of us are dealing with is misinformation uh, or counter-programming, as uh, Director Allen said at a recent news conference. Uh, there are lots of competing messages, and uh, those messages can create confusion. They can undermine confidence in the efficacy of behaviors that will keep us all safe, like wearing face coverings. Uh, we know that uh, at the national level, um, that that competing information uh, and divisive information has reduced the credibility of federal health agencies, and uh, that's a significant challenge. And I'll talk a little bit more about credibility and trust and uh, where we are in Oregon relative um, uh, to those uh, to our partners at the federal level and other states, um, and then who are other trusted messengers. And then I would say. Uh, fatigue is also another challenge that we're confronting at this stage. We're now nine months or more into the COVID-19 pandemic. We've all been riding the roller coaster, uh, the initial uh, concern, fear with the first cases in Oregon, uh, everyone waiting with bated breath for uh, the daily case numbers and then seeing the cases rise and then drop off uh, as we instituted uh, social distancing and the governor's day home orders. Um, and then with reopening, uh, seeing cases rise again and then drop during the summer. And now as we're in the fall, cases are on the upsurge again. And it's difficult for people to sustain the things that we all need to do and yet as communicators, that's what we need to stay focused on is how do we keep people energized and, and provide the information and the tools so that we can all continue to fight COVID-19 and prevent the spread. And then on the opportunities front, so part of the, the I would say the learnings that we've had and the, the ways that we've evolved and adapt our communications is working with partners to focus on how do we reach communities that are hardest hit and how do we do that in ways that respect their history of uh, engagement with our healthcare system, uh, acknowledge, uh, history of inequity and trauma in many cases, um, and recognize the challenges that people face in their daily lives as they grapple with the, uh, the impact of the pandemic in every dimension of their lives. And one of the primary efforts that we've undertaken is partnering with Brink Communications on a campaign called Safe and Strong that we launched uh, early in the in um, the response and uh, and I think as we were communicating about the governor's uh, stay home and save lives orders we recognized that there were many communities who uh, because they disproportionately represented the workforce in essential occupations um, and they were disproportionately in uh, uh, 
seeing um, case rates in their communities and death rates um, because of uh, uh, you know, housing situations and um, living in multi-generational homes that we needed to do a, a, a different kind of messaging and provide a different kind of support because simply saying stay home to save lives to an essential worker who didn't have the option to stay home uh, was, not, was not really going to be sufficient. And so we launched a campaign called Safe and Strong that provided trauma-informed messaging on health information and access to resources and support services, everything from how to address food insecurity to how to access behavioral health services. Um, we uh, leverage paid digital ads and social media ads. Um, uh, we did uh, uh, radio spots in partnership with um, Spanish radio uh, and trans created those messages into 11 different languages. So um, just to be clear, so we were not just simply taking English language content and then having a translator go through and put it into a different language. We were on the ground as we were creating the English content, having uh, speakers of, of the 11 languages that we were uh, trying to reach, uh, put that content into those languages as that content was being developed. And, uh, and I think just as a, an example, uh, you know, covered a wide range of, of topics like support for agricultural workers. Um, we found over the uh, course of the first phase of this campaign, we were getting over 600 Google searches for COVID-19 topics in the seven languages that we were doing um, paid digital advertising in. So uh, it was uh, a, uh, an intense effort. And, um, and then at the same time, it was clear that there was a, a need that we uh, otherwise would not have been able to, met, to meet without that campaign. I think just a couple of other um, points I would say, Collaboration has been really key. Uh, at the Health Authority, we've um, invested in supporting community-based partners to help with contact tracing, uh, work with their local um, public health authorities um, to support contact tracing, uh, as well as uh, we recently um, uh, funded uh, $45 million in partnerships for community-based organizations to provide other supports to, to communities across the state. Um, and as part of that work, we are working with Brain Communications to provide communications tools to CBOs so that they are able to carry health information messages as well as, again, information about how to access the quarantine fund, how to access uh, enhanced SNAP benefits, how to access housing resources, um, how to access you know, the, the, the basic parts of um, so many parts of, of people's lives that have really been uh, disrupted and, and affected by COVID-19. And then uh, again, you know, as we develop and uh, deepen those partnerships, I mean, that's, that's part of the adaptation that, that we needed to do in this response. Uh, we're also working with uh, Google and Facebook. Um, they have provided uh, grant funding to help extend the reach for some of these targeted, uh, uh, culturally competent and, and linguistically specific campaigns. So we appreciate their support and we're gonna continue to explore new technology and social media uh, marketing because uh, we know that we need to do things differently. We can't just um, communicate to people in the, in the ways that we have traditionally in the past. Next slide. So talking to rural audiences has been a, a top priority. Uh, you know, if you've been um, fans of the watch list, uh, you know that rural communities and rural counties have made up um, uh, the bulk of watch list counties uh, that we've been focused on uh, over the past several months. Uh, and as we've seen outbreaks in uh, Umatilla, Malheur, uh, Lincoln County, uh, we worked hard to reach communities um, in those areas. Uh, Spanish radio has been uh, uh, one of our tools. Uh, we do weekly um, 
uh, appearances on Spanish radio with our bilingual uh, health experts uh, and uh, our uh, CPOP program, our community partner outreach program. Uh, and that's been an important tool for us. Uh, the community partner outreach program at OHA also has um, launched uh, OHA in, in Espanol. And uh, that's provided uh, tremendous content and tremendous reach in, in the Spanish speaking community. Uh, again, you know, providing updates on outbreaks, uh, reopening, testing, access to um, supports for migrant and seasonal farm workers. It's really been uh, a tremendous help in, in sharing information that people need to, to get through this pandemic. Talk a little bit about um, some of the CBO partnerships. Uh, for example, we worked with AARP to send uh, mailings to uh, Eastern Oregon seniors about COVID-19. We reached over 120,000 rural households with that. And then uh, we are right now in the process of doing research. Um, and uh, we're doing that research in partnership with, with DHM and Laura Media Services. And I'll talk a little bit about a recent uh, statewide poll in a minute. Uh, but we are continuing to do focus groups and uh, rural audiences are one of the priorities for those focus groups. And uh, so we're digging in and, and getting more of a sense of on a qualitative basis, what are the attitudes, concerns, questions, um, worries that people in, in rural communities have. Next slide. Okay, so without further ado, let me get into uh, survey results. Okay, next slide. So, uh, at the end of August and into early September, we conducted a survey um, in partnership with uh, DHM Research and Laura Media Services. So, there were two components to this survey. First of all, DHM did a survey of 1,009 Oregonians. Um, that included an oversample of 400 people of color to ensure that we were fully hearing from people in communities most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, that survey had a margin of error of uh, plus or minus 3.1 percent. It was conducted uh, over the phone as well as an option where, uh, and, sorry, and phones were both landline and cell phones. And then there was also an option where we texted people and asked if they were willing to participate in the survey. And then uh, if they responded in a positive way, then, then uh, we sent them an online survey. In addition to that statewide survey, Laura Media surveyed an additional 468 Spanish speakers. And that was through direct outreach, both uh, people living in urban communities as well as rural communities. Uh, with an emphasis on migrant workers um, and people working in agricultural settings. And so I'm going to show you the results of that research and, um, and the combined results of, of the survey. And I will um, make distinctions um, where we're speaking to uh, the broad pool of respondents versus uh, people who specifically responded to the Laura Media survey of Spanish speakers. Okay, the next slide. Okay, so the survey really found some good news and some bad news. On the good news front, uh, more than eight in 10 Oregonians are wearing a face mask indoors in public nearly all the time. Another seven in 10 are frequently washing their hands. Um, Nearly seven in 10 are avoiding crowded places. Uh, just over six in 10 are staying six feet apart when in public. By and large, people are hearing the message about the basic things that we all need to do to keep ourselves, the people we love, the people in our community safe. All right, next slide. Uh, on average, as this uh, slide shows, Oregonians uh, see that those protective measures are helping. Uh, you'll see a breakdown here of uh, residents, state residents um, by geography, as well as political affiliation. And uh, you're going to see as I go through these results, 
pretty consistent differences in geography, uh, political affiliation and ideology. Uh, in some cases, we'll see some um, differences both um, in age, uh, by ethnicity, and in other ways. But on this question about protective measures, I, mean, I think we saw the most consensus that, that, um, that we saw throughout the, the questions that we asked. All right, next slide. Okay, now we get into some of the things that are a little bit concerning. So even while a, a significant portion of Oregonians are doing the things they need to do to stay safe, we see that uh, only just over four in 10 Oregonians are very concerned about the overall COVID-19 situation in Oregon. And then even less, fewer than a quarter of Oregonians worry, are very worried that they or a person they live with will actually get sick with the disease. So I think we're uh, I think both surprised by these results and a little concerned about what that lack of urgency may bode as people begin to tire of living with the restrictions that COVID-19 has placed on all of us um, and whether or not that's going to erode the level of uh, adherence to safe behaviors that, that people reported um, in the previous slide. Next slide. And again, some differences in gender, uh, race and ethnicity, and um, political affiliation. Okay, next slide. And last but not least, we asked about receptivity to a COVID-19 vaccine, which we hope is coming down the pike and we hope will be safe and effective. Um, uh, however, uh, despite the coverage and uh, people's hopes and expectations for a vaccine, only four in 10 Oregonians said they would definitely get a COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. And as we've seen in other questions, uh, breakdowns according to region, race and ethnicity, and education with people who are most likely to get the vaccine living in the Tri-County area, Asians, nearly six in 10 said they would, and people with college educations. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, so let me talk about some recommendations that come out of both the lessons that we've learned communicating about COVID-19 these past nine months and the um, research that we've conducted and are continuing to conduct. Next slide. One of the questions we asked in the poll was uh, about what reasons uh, do people cite for wearing a mask? And the reasons that uh, the people really gravitated to were to protect family, friends, people they live with. Uh, that was the most uh, compelling message, most persuasive message for or Oregonians as a whole, and also for the Latino community. Similarly, helping uh, stopping the spread of the virus in the community so schools and businesses can reopen also polled strongly. Um, nearly a third of, of people in both general population and, and Latino audience um, uh, cited that as a reason to wear a mask. I think what was striking was that uh, the message of protecting yourself uh, was not a particularly compelling message, uh, nor was the message to protect healthcare workers and essential workers. Uh, so while you know, it seems that people were um, motivated to wear a mask uh, with an awareness of protecting the people directly around them and the people that they live with, as well as sort of a broader uh, effort to reopen schools and the economy. Uh, people were not self-interested or, um, or again, were not motivated with a sense of protecting healthcare workers or the healthcare system. So with that in mind though, however, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, 
our key takeaway and what I would recommend um, to this audience, as you're communicating to people, appeal to that, that clearly compelling message of protecting loved ones and protecting friends and protecting people you live with. That, um, that was the message that resonated. I think the other thing that we've learned is we have to address real concerns. So again, uh, uh, as we've seen um, in our experience and in some of the survey work, that when people are not able to wear a mask or people are not able to quarantine, there are often very specific reasons. Or when people can't stay home, there are very specific reasons. Uh, and so this is uh, from the Laura Media Service uh, report uh, this is a breakdown of the question about, uh, for Latinos, why um, would you not stay home if you experience symptoms of COVID-19? And as you see here, um, some real practical barriers um, to that. It's not that people aren't motivated. It's not that people don't get how serious COVID-19 is. Um, however, uh, more than four in 10 people said, I wouldn't stay home because I'm the only person who works in my home. I have to support my family. I have to take care of those essential needs. Or I don't have health insurance, you know, another barrier. Um, so as we communicate, that's why we uh, designed the Safe and Strong campaign to not just communicate health information, but also communicate information about how to access counseling and, and behavioral health support, how to access housing, uh, how to access the quarantine fund um, so that people can have wage replacement if they get sick and, and they can't work. Um, uh, and I think the other thing we try to do is uh, just provide opportunities to engage with our health experts through things like Facebook Live, uh, where people can uh, interact directly with uh, our epidemiologists and, and our doctors and, and ask questions about our data, about testing, um, other common uh, topics that, that people are concerned about. And then finally, I think, you know, last but not least on this, uh, it's really critical to, to tackle rumors and, and misinformation head on, particularly in this day and age of, of social media. Uh, people in healthcare and, and people who are concerned about public health really need to engage. Um, I think for a long time, we often grappled with the question of like, well, if if there's a rumor out there or there's misinformation circulating on, on social media, if we address it, are we feeding it? Are we giving it oxygen? I think pretty clearly the data and, and best practices around the world show that, that it's important to take it on. So, uh, you know, if you follow our uh, weekly media briefings, you'll see that um, we have tackled things like uh, mischaracterizations of how we gather death data related to COVID-19. Um, and tackling uh, misinformation that that somehow we have been exaggerating the COVID-19 death count. Uh, we have also tackled the topic of whether COVID-19 is um, more serious or less serious than the flu. COVID-19 is at least 20 times as fatal as the flu, and we've been communicating that message and, and urging our, our um, media outlets around the state to, to help provide accurate information. Next slide. Okay. Uh, last but not least, I think it's really critical to leverage trusted messengers in communicating about this pandemic and, and other health topics. Uh, and yeah, this is a slide from a national report uh, that looked at uh, trust and credibility in different institutions um, throughout the course of the pandemic. As you'll see, and probably not surprisingly, uh, nearly every institution has experienced a decline in trust, including state government. Uh, at the outset of the pandemic, I did see some independent polling that showed that um, trust in uh, the Oregon Health Authority was up close to the CDC, which at the time um, was high in, in, in that survey. We have not done any uh, 
polling on that question, and I haven't seen any uh, other polling. So I can't say whether OHA has seen a, an erosion in, in trust and credibility on par with um, some of the, the institutions and the figures you see here. Uh, I know that local health officials and, and county governments um, came in lower than state health experts, but, uh, but, but generally in the ballpark. So I think uh, local health officials also have strong voices. Uh, one thing that stands out in my mind here is that when you look at these findings over time, doctors and hospitals remain strong, trusted messengers, uh, scientists and researchers. So people who are at the front lines in responding to the pandemic and caring for their communities continue to have trust, even while trust continues to erode uh, in, in other institutions all around us. So I just want to flag that for this audience, because I know there are many of you out there uh, who are in those roles. And I want to just urge you and remind you, you have a strong, trusted voice. And I just want to encourage you to use it as we, as we go forward with this pandemic, as we continue to address health and equity in the pandemic, as we continue to fight COVID-19 fatigue and work together to keep Oregonians safe. All right, so with that, uh, I really want to thank you for the opportunity to present this information, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for having me here this morning. I'm from All Care Health, and I want to explain a little bit about our role in the community. Uh, we've been serving Southern Oregon for 26 years. Uh, currently, our service area includes Jackson, Josephine, Curry, and Southern Douglas counties, and as a benefit corporation, we strive to create positive change within our broader local communities. That's in addition to the impact we have on our members and customers. We're perhaps known throughout the state as being a coordinated care organization, known as All Care CCO, but here locally in Southern Oregon, All Care Health is also a family of companies that includes All Care Advantage, a Medicare Advantage plan, All Care Pace, which will be opening shortly, and is a program of all-inclusive care for the elderly, all Care Independent Physician Association, All Care eHealth Services, and All Care Management Services, which focus on providing supports to our local independent providers. So while we focus on um, the care of our members, we're also focused on our providers and helping support them to be able to do what they do best, and that's helping the health of the community. So pandemic, COVID-19 happened. Next slide, please. So there are some initial challenges of living in a uh, rural area. One was that we found we had insufficient existing awareness, connections, and processes that were there to ensure timely cultural and linguistically appropriate communications across community resources. Our region had a lack of work by, workforce diversity, and if implemented, workforce diversity brings language access to the forefront. Our community had a lack of urgency in the perception of the pandemic due to low case counts in the region in the early days. So while the state was shutting down, most of our community didn't realize the importance. And then there was rapidly changing and often seemingly contradictory information that was driving public distrust. This was the nature of a new disease with little known about it. Alongside of that was a rapid, rapid spread of false information largely promoted through social media. And then in a rural area, we have small communication teams by nature, and they're generally juggling a lot of work. Um, with COVID and the increased demand on communication, our workloads increase extreme. Next slide. But we also had opportunities to face all of those challenges. Some of that was using our existing relationships to aid in the transcreation of materials um, that were culturally and linguistically appropriate. And then the collaboration, facilitating the collaboration between local public health authorities, healthcare providers, our community benefit organizations, and then utilizing the medical interpreters and translators that All Care has spent um, the last three years working to develop. Our learned understanding of local sentiments to guide communication approach and methods was very helpful. 
And then we are inv uh, involved directly with affected communities in the creation of messaging. For example, we had language access staff that were um, an active part of Latinx steering committees. And then we were able to take live um, feedback from our communities and target messaging to answer their questions and concerns. And then lastly, we had access to data that helped illuminate the local demographics and helped identify potential needs. We were then able to share um, those focus areas with our community partners and help draw all um, attention to those who needed it most. Next. So what did this look like in action? From the very beginning, All Care Health's main initiatives were to support public health efforts and the rapid creation and dissemination of accurate information. This went to several different audiences. It was the healthcare providers, for example, sharing testing protocol information in a timely manner, to community benefit organizations, those delivering services directly to our community, to the community at large, making sure they had accurate information, and then also to our members. We wanted to raise awareness and encourage increased language access considerations for timely distribution of information, making sure that information was accurate and translated appropriately, and then making sure that those populations had access to needed services and knew how to access them. We wanted to express a unified leadership approach to our communities. We wanted to mirror the same messaging across multiple uh, organizations so that we all came through with the same message. Whenever we helped create a document or a communication, through agreements we also made sure that it was shareable between all counties so that every county had the same access to translated materials and um, we're sharing the same message. Next slide. Early on, we um, had the great opportunity of working together with several local partners, both healthcare and community organizations, to put together a PSA that basically shared a message of unity, that we are all working together, we are all there to support our community, and that um, we were there for them through this difficult time. Next slide. Here are some examples of being able to help in communications uh, with public health in the very beginning, there were very few um, pieces of information. And what was um, being distributed was a lot of um, unsightly Word documents um, that were quickly created. And so our teams were able to help put them into a graphically pleasing way for the uh, health department. And then also make sure that they got translated using um, certified translators and then distributed. The future, so what have we learned? Well, the first big important thing is rethinking print communication. It validated, it validated our increased focus on electronic methods of communication due to the fact that they have faster development times, they're quickly updatable as information changes, and then you can direct users to a single location as that information changes. This helps uh, with version control and make sure that they're getting the most up-to-date information at any given time. It also can allow for self-sign-up of updates. For example, email newsletters and alerts. This was very helpful specifically with our provider network and that they were able to sign up if they weren't already receiving those pieces of information and know that they could get the information quickly. Another lesson is audience focus. Focusing on language and culture, identifying the populations within your region, and learning from those populations what is most important to them and how best to reach them is very important, and we can't forget that as we move past COVID-19. Lastly, messaging simplification, sorting through the noise, helping identify the important pieces of information for the public and then making the communication simple and easy to follow, and then repeating. Repeating the same messaging over and over, wear a mask, keep your distance, stay home when you're sick, wash your hands. Really, at the heart, those are very important messages. They're simple, they're easy to follow, and they're actionable. 
So keeping your messaging simple and using repetition has the most impact in the long run. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you today, and I look forward to questions. Hello, my name is Brooke Pace, and I am the Communications and Public Relations Director for Wallowa Memorial Hospital in beautiful Enterprise, Oregon. Next slide. SARS-CoV-2 is a novel emerging coronavirus. What is the truth in the morning is a lie in the afternoon. I heard this statement at a virtual conference I was attending a few months back, and it was like, mind blown. It was such an aha moment for me because I realized that these two simple sentences really summed up so much of why we have so many challenges around communicating during a pandemic. If you look back and read it again, novel, it's new. It's something we've never dealt with before. It's emerging. Things are changing at such a rapid pace. And in order to keep the communication accurate, it has to be going on all the time. Next slide. And that's what I'm here to talk to you a little bit about today is the challenges we as a hospital have faced while communicating during a pandemic. Next slide. The first challenge I would like to talk about is polarization. This is an unfortunate reality that's happening everywhere. Willowa County is a melting pot of farmers and ranch owners and shop owners and artists. And many of the people who live here rely on tourism to support their livelihood. When the stay at home orders for Oregon were lifted, but we were still asking people to stay home as much as possible, tension hit an all time high. All of a sudden, if you were in support of preventative measures, you were anti-business. And this created a really unique challenge for us at the hospital. While we were busy creating public service announcements for people to stay home to slow the spread, tourism continued to boom here as people saw our low infection rates and also an opportunity to really enjoy the great outdoors. We were constantly being asked, how is it okay for people from all over the country to come and converge on our little mountain town and shop in our grocery stores and wander our streets, but you're telling me it's not okay to invite my friends and family over for a meal around my table or to attend a church service on Sunday? People were really frustrated and confused. Uh, the picture that you see on this slide um, really showcases that fear. A concerned community member took the liberty of repainting a portion of the sign at the edge of our little town in Joseph. Uh, it really showed the separation between people who were fighting for their livelihood and people who, frankly, in the beginning were concerned for their lives. Um, when the pandemic became political, this challenge perhaps became the biggest hurdle that we had to face. All of a sudden, you were either red or blue. You were a believer or you were a skeptic, a masker or someone who believes their rights are being stripped away. And it's really a hard pill to swallow as society starts to lose sight of some of the things that we in healthcare value so much, and that's data and science and care and compassion. Uh, one of the other major challenges that we have had to face is the lack of local public health here. Uh, the Willowa County Board of Commissioners voted unanimously in April of 2018 to transfer its local public health authority to the state agency. Willowa County no longer has a local public health administrator. What didn't seem to be a big deal at the time suddenly had astronomical implications. Who's going to support our local population on information about the virus and preventative measures? Who's going to report to the public about cases and unfortunately deaths? As a leader in healthcare in our community, that responsibility fell upon our shoulders. Now, don't get me wrong, OHA has done an amazing job at providing all of this information, but people still want to hear it from a local source as opposed to a state agency. And what about contact tracing? Who's gonna actually pick up the phone when they see a number that starts with 503 rather than 541? Next slide. 
And as you might have guessed, we've had a few more challenges. With each new clinical report, with every new YouTube video with the latest conspiracy theory, and here, every single new case, questions, questions, and more questions. Can I get tested? Why can't I get tested? Am I gonna get COVID from petting my dog? Who is that person that you just announced has COVID and where exactly have they been? Some of the questions we had answers to and others we didn't. Some of the questions we had the information but weren't able to release it. And when questions go unanswered, fear, anxiety, mistrust, and anger sit in. The next point I have is access to timely information. Social media is a beautiful tool, but here in Wallowa County, 30% of our population is 65 or older, and 25% of those people don't have access to internet. So Facebook alone wasn't going to cut it. Our local newspaper goes to print once a week. And so in the beginning, a story that was wrapped up on Monday was often obsolete by the time it went to press on Wednesday, which caused a great deal of confusion and frustration. We had to find a way to hit all of the tra traditional outlets on a regular basis as the information around testing and guidance put forth by the state was just changing so very rapidly. And the last point that I wanna make on challenges is really where I feel like the chapter we're in today. You can call it COVID fatigue, you can call it caution fatigue, whatever you wanna call it. People are absolutely tired of hearing about COVID. They're tired of talking about COVID. They're tired about this, of this virus affecting every aspect of their daily life. People are no longer waiting with bated breath for our next public service announcement and then sharing that information the moment that I hit publish. The newspaper isn't calling for interviews with physicians every week like they once were. And our phones aren't ringing off the hook quite as much anyways. And this doesn't mean that we still don't have important information to share. Even though people are tired, the virus continues to be strong. Next slide. But just as the Einstein quote at the beginning of my presentation states, every challenge can also be viewed as an opportunity through risk communication to inform and protect our community and our organization, we've been able to lay a strong foundation of trust. Next slide. And I'd just like to share with you a few ways that we've done that. Uh, it, makes me laugh to see the photo on that previous slide because it just is so weird to see people sitting next to each other without masks on, uh, but at once that was reality. So when the word of the very first COVID positive case came about in Oregon, the sky was literally falling. People didn't know what to think, they didn't know what to do, and many people were very scared. And so in an effort to curtail some of that fear, we decided to, to, to host a town hall. Looking back, you think, gosh, yeah, we invited everyone to gather in a room and ask questions about COVID, but it goes back to that uh, emergent, or emergent case that I just made on how you know, the information has changed so much. But at the town hall, we also did a live Facebook stream. And so people were able to ask the questions that they had to a panel of local providers that came from all of the primary care clinics here in Wallowa County. And it created a sense of peace and ease that we were going to be there for our community to help understand the questions they had and address them. We, we called this town hall, Prepare, Don't Panic. And I think it was very aptly named. The second point I'd like to make on some of our successes is we developed a COVID hotline here at the hospital. We were receiving a massive amount of calls in the beginning as people just had so many questions. And so what we did was we would create a pre-recorded message. Sometimes it would have to be changed multiple times a day, but it had the basic information that people were looking for on symptoms, on testing, and then eventually on the cases uh, that have been identified in Malawa County. 
And if their questions weren't answered by listening to this pre-recorded message, we invited people to leave a message and vowed to return each and every call within 24 hours. To combat that political polarization that we saw happening, we invited our local elected officials to be part of our message so that we could stand together as a united front to do what was best for our community. We continue to put out frequent public service announcements. We feature our CMO, we feature our CNO, also our infection control officer, all of our local physicians and those elected officials that I was just speaking about. And we do this through Facebook videos. We know that not everyone has Facebook. So after a video is recorded, we extract the sound bites from the video and provide that to our local radio station. And they air those messages in both their morning and evening news segments. This was a way for us to try and reach as many people as possible. Lastly, one of the things that we have done that has received a lot of positive feedback has been the reporting of regional information. So many people in Willowa County have to travel outside of Willowa County for their essential needs. Uh, we refer to this as a Costco run here. <laughs> By reporting of the infection rates in one location of our neighboring areas in a really brief graphic, people were able to make informed decisions about where they were going to travel or if they were going to travel at all for those different items that they needed. Next slide. But it's not all just doom and gloom. Uh, I believe that every cloud does have a silver lining. And during the last nine months, we've also seen this community do what it's always done, and that's come together to provide for those in need. The local quilting guild made over 5,000 hand-sewn masks. And just to put that into perspective, our population is 7,000, so they nearly made a mask for everyone in Willowa County and distributed them at different locations throughout the county. This, of course, was before you could buy a mask at literally any retailer in the world. <laughs> a group of concerned citizens set up a network to shop and provide for the homebound and the high risk and those people in quarantine. And when the PPE shortages were in full effect, we had many people donate things from gloves to rolls of Clorox wipes and yes, even toilet paper. <laughs> now that is love. Our transparency and communication during a time of shutdown made it possible for us to quickly bounce back from the hit of suspending elective procedures because our community knew that the hospital was and would continue to be a safe place to come for care. Our mantra through all of this has been, we're all in this together. And boy, isn't that the truth? Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you all for such a great set of present. Thank you all for such a great set of presentations. We greatly appreciate it. We will make sure that all the questions and answers that people typed in are going to be posted on the website when we uh, post these presentations up. So if you didn't get your question answered, um, we will get that to you. And I'm sorry we won't get to do a live question and answer at this point, but we'll be moving on now to our next presentation, uh, which is managing your recruitment in a virtual world. Thanks everybody for being here.